All right, I want to greet each one in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A blessing it is to be here together with you all this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your love and care for us, Father. We just ask that you would help us, Father, to see you and to be faithful to you, to hear your voice. God, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit and give us wisdom, Father. Again, we just thank you for all that you do for us. Help us to be faithful in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Again, blessed this morning by the young, young men's verses, the boys and young men. There's so much to learn about wisdom, and, and uh, that's something that we can obtain. We don't have to be smart to have wisdom. We don't have to be educated to have wisdom. We can have wisdom, the Bible says, by asking for it and seeking it. It's not something you can put in paper. It's just wisdom. And a lot of that wisdom has to do with our mouths. It just, it's the evidence of that wisdom and just, just being wise and sometimes just learning when not to say something. That wisdom comes by iron sharpening iron, like one of the boys said. And, and uh, often, just working together, being a brotherhood, things get grating sometimes. We all get graded or uh, chided or there's just conflict sometimes. And real wisdom manifests that in just getting through it, just going through it, and being patient and loving each other. There's no place to give up. We may get discouraged, we may get disappointed, but there is not a, a giving up place. All we're called to do in this life is to be faithful and to go through it. And whatever we may go through, our only responsibility is not the results at the end. Our responsibility is not just making sure everything's fine. Our responsibility is to go through it and whatever we're facing in life. And I know sometimes life looks dark sometimes and, and things look like there's no end and in the tunnel, sometimes it looks very difficult and it just looks like it's never going to quit. But there's no place to give up. Just our responsibility is just to go through it. And some of the things that I've gone through in my life, that's been my only comfort. That all I have to do is go through this. I don't understand it. I don't like it. It's... My life is turned upside down, but all I have to do is go through it. And that's what Jesus did when he came for us, is he lived his life trusting in the Lord, and he went through it. And that's just all, all that there was to it. And that's, that's all we're called to do. Sometimes just going through it, we may get beat up. We may get wounded. We may be on the point of death. We may be to the place where we, but there's rest in all we have to do is go through it. So I just want to encourage you this morning with that. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 13 with those things in mind going through it. Verse 33, John chapter 13, verse 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. 
you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I want to just stop there just a minute, talking a little bit this morning. He, he, he says little children. Little children. And just thinking on the verse we talked about a couple of weeks ago about having a childlike faith, or the Bible says, if you don't come to me like little children, one of the distinguishing things about children is, is they are able to learn. They are able to learn. They can be doing something one way and you show them a better way and it, the, the old way's gone, they pick up the new way. They learn it. They're resilient. They can change when they know they're wrong. He mentions here in this verse, said, like I said to the Jews, the problem with the Jews is they weren't like little children. They were rigid. They weren't able to learn. They had their way and they stayed with it. But a little child can hear something new and change. It's hard for us. I've spent my entire Christian life unlearning what I thought I knew about following the Lord. I've had to change a lot of things and still do, and still want to be able to. That's what life is. When you take the ability to learn or grow or change out, you're a robot. And that's what we want to. It's one of the dangers. Uh, one of the things I want to bring out this morning you know, there's been times in my life whenever I was concerned about where I am with the Lord or, or what's going on with the Lord, that there's times in my life that I would go to the law or I would go to the, even the New Testament and just find the rules there and I could find comfort in knowing that I could just live within those rules. You look at the Ten Commandments, you know, if you just look at them as a rule book, you can look at them, mm -hmm. and someone that just is halfway serious about life can basically rest by living in those laws. I'm not talking about spiritually right with God, but we find comfort in them because we can do them. And then we can turn to the New Testament and read the teachings of Jesus and we can live within the teachings of the New Testament as a rule book and as a guide. And we can find comfort because, well, I'm living in this little set of rules or this set of teachings of Jesus. And I'm able to live within them. And so we can find a comfort for ourselves. But that's not what faith is. Faith is not a comfortable place in our life. Having faith is not being confident that I'm right. Many times faith is just exactly the opposite of that. It's just keeping on going when we don't know for sure what to do. <clears throat> now, verse 34. This is one of the last talks that Jesus is having with his disciples. He's telling them, I'm going away. <clears throat> I'm, I'm leaving you. This is the sad goodbye. And he's sat down and he's saying, I'm going to leave you. My little children, I'm going to leave you. And where I'm going, you can't come with me. And then he says, a new commandment I leave with you. 
that you love one another. You know, if we would look at a person's life and, and uh, we can see the whole life that they're living and we can talk and learn and share, you know, we can learn some valuable things about their life. But when a man is about ready to leave or is about ready to die, that's when things get real serious. I've been around people right before they die. And their thoughts that right before they died are the most important thing there is at that moment. Their thoughts at that time, they get real down to the point, real to the heart of things when they're about ready to die, when they're about ready to go away. It gets serious then. And Jesus at this point, maybe one of the last times he's just going to have his disciples where he could just sit down and talk to them. You know, I think sometimes there are some people I would like to just be able to talk to one last time. Here's Jesus wanting to say something to his disciples one last time. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That rule book goes thrown right out the window. He just took the rule book, tore it up and threw it out the window. Here's what matters, that you love one another. My hope of just resting in a commandments all goes right out the window whenever he says, this is the one thing I ask of you. The one thing I want you to do is to love one another. Our creator comes down to this earth lives and walks and eats and drinks, breathes on this earth. And at the day or two before he dies, the last talk he gets to give to his disciples, he tells them, love one another. Can you imagine God in heaven looking down on this earth and all the things that are going on in this world and a bunch of people have a religion over here and a religion over here and they can't stand each other right here in the middle. People that say they believe things over here, same things over here and over there, but then they can't stand each other. His commandment is to love one another. That's what He wants. That is the purpose of creation was for mankind to love each other, his own creation. He creates somebody on this hand and somebody on this hand, and then they fight. He didn't create people to be enemies with each other. He created them to love one another. And we can easily say, yes, everybody ought to love me. Everybody ought to treat me the way I want to be treated. And we talked about that last week, about how we hear the Scriptures. Whenever we say everybody ought to love one another, what we're really saying is everybody ought to love me. Exactly opposite of what he meant. We live in a world today where everyone is so sensitive. 
You can't say anything about anybody without somebody getting offended. Or you hurt my feelings. You know what that is? Is me hearing Jesus saying, everybody ought to love me. When he said, we ought to love one another. Part of loving one another is not actually going out and doing something for someone else. It's when someone does something to me, I can let it go. When someone hurts me, I can get over it. That's the answer to your questions. That's the answer to your problems, a lot of them. Is loving one another no matter how they treat me. See, the only way you overcome evil is to overcome being treated evil. You know, we might not hurt a fly. We might be a good person. We might, you know, wouldn't want to see anybody hurt. And that's good. But then when someone hurts us, we let them hurt us bad. And then we just nurse that wound and pamper that wound and just hurt ourselves instead of loving one another. Part of getting along is learning how to be hurt without getting hurt. It's learning how to get your blade put up against a sharp stone without getting all bent out of whack about it. Letting it sharpen you instead of destroying you. That's part of love. That's part of loving one another. That's what happened to Jesus. If anybody in this world had any right to be offended, it was Jesus. But he was without offense. I just sometimes I'm so blessed by Stephen that he tried to tell the people about the Lord and about his goodness, and they stoned him. And his prayer was, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And the blessed thing is the picture is that Jesus was standing watching Stephen be martyred because he was going through. He was going through. It takes love just to go through. You know, we can look at all of the positive things that we need to do to love one another. But if we get this part right, it will work. We can get through anything if we don't decide. I've had all I can stand I can't take any more. That's when love stops. Loving one another stops and self-preservation takes over. That destroys us. Love. The picture of Jesus is love. Is taking everything this world throws at us and going through it. Like I said, we can look at the picture of love and think what I can do for somebody else. And those are all good. But just like everything else, that's just one part of the picture. And just like everything else, taking only one part of it that looks good on the outside is just like me resting in, well, I can keep the commandments. And so I must be good. It 
is not real. It may, there's people in the world that can just appear wonderful. But do they love one another? And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then it says in verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. if you have love one for another. Did he say that the world will know because you have the biggest microphone and you can tell people how much you love Jesus? That you can be the strictest there is in town? That you won't tolerate anybody that isn't just like you? That you tell everybody, everyone will know I'm a Christian because I go to this church. They will know because of your love one for another. And how opposite that is when you look at the history of Christianity. Oh, you don't agree with me on this point? I'll have nothing to do with you. And so we separate and divide and scatter and divide and scatter and divide. We've got our own little groups and we can't get along with anybody. But we love Jesus. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's not what he said. In his most intimate time before his death with his disciples. If we would start right here before we start building churches, <clears throat> instead of trying to fix that problem or this problem or that problem, here's the heart of the problem. Just like everything else, when you get to the heart of the problem, that's why John the Baptist said the ax is laid to the root of the tree because that's where the problem is. We can have all kinds of externals get to the root of the problem and most of the problems will take care of themselves. Or at least there will be a love enough among the brethren to get through those problems. We see it in the world all the time. And it is the world. Someone gets wounded and someone comes along and fans the flame of that wound. And people get their emotions all stirred up about a subject or a topic. Or they find someone that is the cause of that problem. And so they allow their emotions to rule them. And they get carried away, carrying torches and pitchforks against whatever the problem is. But if they had love one for another, they could patiently get through whatever problem comes along. Christianity is no different than the world. Someone comes along and whispers a little something in your ear your ears perk up. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's right. They did that to me. I'm going to get all upset. And so we wind up finding ourselves all stirred up about a problem. And the next thing we do, we're grabbing our pitchfork and the torch. You see the picture of the rioters causing problems. It's the opposite having love one for another. Love one for another takes patience. You can't help anyone without patience.
takes time and patience to do anything. Did I mention it takes patience? By this all men shall know that you have love one for another. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That's what the church is all about. You know, somebody has problems, everybody's there to help them. Somebody's barn burns down, everybody jumps in and helps. We say, oh, that's love for your community. And yeah, it is. It's good. It's a part of it. But love comes is whenever you're just trying to live together and both of you got things going good and there's some little problem comes up between you and one of them one of you don't want to have patience. Go your separate ways and then wait for the barn to burn down and you rush in to help the barn and call that love. Love is not waiting for a calamity to happen. Love is when you're working together every day, helping one another, overlooking each other, and loving each other, getting along. Not when everything's rosy. Love is being able to see one another's blemishes and still go right on with it. It's going through. Acts. Chapter 4, verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Of one heart and soul. Does that mean they all agreed to the same doctrine? Or were they of one heart and soul? You know, we can all agree to the exact points of doctrine and not have one heart and soul with one another. If our focus is on following Jesus, everyone who follows Jesus with that same heart and soul will be at one with another. It doesn't say find all the exact points and agree with them. If you follow Jesus, and He follows Jesus, and I follow Jesus, and our heart is to please the Lord, pleasing the Lord is loving one another. It doesn't mean we're all going to look alike and act alike. We're not all on the same page all the time as far as our points. Like I said, if I had to forsake everybody I was with every time I learned something, which is what happens most of the time, we would find ourselves either all by ourselves, sitting on some mountain somewhere thinking we're Noah, or we're just going to quietly lay down in the middle of our own set of little rules that we've just all agreed to because that's how we can get along. But if our heart and soul 
is to love God with all our heart and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we will be of one heart and soul, even though there's differing points. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him that was his own, but all things were common property to them. That doesn't mean we just sell everything, put it in a pot, and we all live in one little house and get along. It means that I love my neighbor, I love my brethren so much that if my brother has a need, it doesn't, it's, it's not mine. It's all the Lord's. Our nothing that we have is ours anyway. I don't know how many people, you go to an auction, you go to people have estate sales or something. And this person's entire life is being sold. Oh, I'll take a quarter for that, 50 cents for that, dollar for that. And their children are just trying to get rid of their whole life so they can put five or six hundred dollars in their pocket. And it's gone. Or there's a big fight. I want this, I want that. And then the lawyers wind up with all of it. But the person that had it and thought it was his don't have a say in it anymore. People get stuck in nursing homes and get the power of attorney and their children take everything from them, stick them in a nursing home. And they've got some little teenage girl running around wiping the drool off their chin. They don't own anything. We don't own anything. These people understood that. And their property counted not as their own, but as was needed. All we have to do is go through it. It's not what we can claim or gain out of this life. It's not what we, level of comfort that we're looking to out of this life. It's keeping our eyes on the Lord and not on the storm that's raging around us. And just go through whatever he sets in front of us. Just go through it. People are trying all ways to find a way out of it, to escape, to run away from it, to hide from it. Whenever the only peace and rest there is, is going through it. May the Lord add His blessing on His words.